Hey, and welcome to another special TV edition of Get Real. I'm Hot Toddy, and clearly, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm here to talk more about the new season of Mystery Science Theater 3000. I've been gone for a little bit in terms of talking about the new season, but I am back, and we're going to talk about the last few episodes that have premiered, episodes 4, 5, and 6, which are Munchy, Dr. Mordred, and Demon Squad, respectively. And uh, there's a lot to get into, there's a lot to talk about, I'm going to try my best to convert all of this into one episode. It ain't going to be easy, but we're, we're going to do our best. Uh, clearly, if you can see by what's with me in this episode, there's one episode in particular that I'm very excited to talk about, and we're going to get to that here in just a bit. But right now, let's get into the first episode of these three, which is, of course, Munchie. Munchie was awful. No, seriously, this movie was terrible. Listen. You know, we they've watched bad movies before, and of course, in addition to being a fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000, I'm also a fan of Red Letter Media, and so I have been put through the ringer with both MST3K and Best of the Worst in terms of watching bad movies, and we've watched bad movies on the Smoking Hot Toddcast Live. There's a lot of bad movies that I have been through. Never have I been through one that was as bad as Munchie. And it's upsetting, because Munchie was a sequel, you know, to a to a fun movie. It was one of the, you know, many critter films of the 80s, little monster critter films. Uh, Munchies, of course, was the film that it was a sequel of, and it's a great film. It's horribly entertaining, and in my opinion, anyway. Uh, and Munchie just didn't cut the mustard. It is, without a doubt, one of the worst films ever made, and I, I feel sorry for everyone in the MST3K cast and crew that had to sit through it. From what I understand, the, the, it was hard to endure this film for, in terms of writing purposes. Of course, you know, if, if you've been watching the new season, you probably caught the live stream and heard, uh, you know, Jonah and the, and the gang talk about just how horrible it was to have to sit through it to even write jokes. Apparently, Felicia Day had PTSD following this film. Uh, apparently, Rebecca Hansen did too. I was tweeting with her, and uh, she said it was one of the worst experiences of her life. So, needless to say, uh, Munchie left a mark on everybody's life, and uh, not just the MST crew, but us as well. I mean, to sit through this film, yeah, I mean, Dom DeLuise, you gotta give it up for him. I mean, the man was a comedy genius, legend, whatever you want to call him. All of that and more, really. Uh, but when it came to this film, even he couldn't save it. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime gal. So, you know, Munchie was just... It was just awful. I don't have any other words to describe Munchie. Munchie was just the worst. And the reaction to Munchie's entrance into the movie uh, was very warranted. Oh, oh no! Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, this is happening! Please stop! Please stop! Please stop! I don't want to stop! Please 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 the show itself, though, was fantastic. The episode was great. Jonah and the bots were on point. Uh, the riffs, like I said, have been so solid this season. I loved, uh, you know, the, the Netflix era, but as I've said, I, th I know I said it in the first uh, Get Real on the new season. I think maybe I said it in the last one, too, but it just felt like we were being berated by jokes in that season, like they had no time to land. We would laugh, but then there would be one there we'd miss, you know, it they were just coming out so fast that you really didn't have a whole lot of time. But this season, the jokes land, and they are spectacular. And uh, the riffs and Munchie, despite the fact that they had to go through so much turmoil uh, to get this uh, episode on the air, they were fantastic. They were hilarious. Oh, Miss Laurel, may I see you in my office a moment, please? I'll be right there, Mr. Thornton. Maybe just change into an even more inappropriate outfit for an elementary school. I lost my champagne flutes in the divorce. Will these do their dessert cups? Look, the house is on fire! They're in the house, jeez. Still worked. One of my favorite uh, parts of the episode was the host segment where we introduced Baby Munchie. 
That was both horrifying and glorious at the same time. I love that puppet and I, I love what they did with it. So uh, Munchie, with without, without a doubt, was a, a hard episode to get through, just in terms of the movie, in terms of the riffs. I mean, it's, it was on, right on point, right where we need to be uh, as we get in deeper into this season. There was one complaint by Misty's, uh, and I kept seeing it over and over, and I get it, uh, even I agree, it's kind of like, well, did you just didn't have any ideas for this or what? Uh, the, the invention exchange that Jonah did was the, basically the exact same invention exchange that Joel did in the Crash of the Moons episode uh, from 1992. Uh, so, season four, of course. And so, one has to think, are they just playing on nostalgia? They didn't really go into that uh, on the post show. So I don't really know if, if it was just playing on nostalgia or if they just didn't have an idea for an invention for that episode, I don't know. I love that invention. I think it was, I think it was extremely funny. And the first time I saw it in Crash of the Moon, uh, but I, I didn't know if that was just, you know, playing it up for yucks. I'm not sure, but that was a little weird because uh, I'd never seen that before, where they were, where they basically did a callback to the invention exchange. So uh, that was kind of weird, but I, I did love it. I did enjoy it, and I enjoyed it the first time. Like I said, when it was with Crash of the Moon, so. Uh, a, little, a little weird on that, but it was still very entertaining. And like I said, overall, the episode uh, was great. Oh, but there was one extremely, extremely high point for me uh, when it came to the Munchie episode. This was the episode where my name was featured in the credits. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I'm famous now. Oh, oh, well, thank you. Oh, that, that's so, you didn't have to go. Oh my gosh, there's more and more applause. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm humbled. Yes, yes, my name was featured in the end credits of, of Munchie. And I have to admit, if there was an episode of the season that I would I would have wanted my name to be featured in, I, I would pick Munchie because Munchie is probably going to be, I don't know, we still have a long way to go till the end of the season, but I, it's going to be, if not the most memorable episode of the season, it's definitely going to be one, one of the most memorable uh, episodes because of just how bad the movie was but that was a highlight for me but yeah munchie can can eat a bag of dicks gotta be munchie trademark munchie llc next is episode five dr mordred which starred the great uh, jeffrey combs uh which i was very excited about and I, I think a lot of people were and really the question came down to why were they riffing dr mordred because though it was a low budget film uh, it's a good film, you know. It is a ripoff of Doctor Strange. Obviously, it's it's a it's a Doctor Strange knockoff, but it's a good movie. And Jeffrey Combs brings it, you know. In, in any film that he's in, he brings it, and uh, so it made this film very entertaining. So, uh, complete opposite of Munchie, this film was so much more entertaining and just fun to watch. As opposed to the the, the, the bag of dicks that I mentioned earlier uh, of Munchie, it just it was. Oh, apples and oranges, day and night, stuffing, potatoes, you know, you know what I'm talking about. The, the, the extreme differences in Munchie and Dr. Mordred are extreme. That's how different they are. Um, but I, it was such a great film and really entertaining. And, you know, that's, that's the thing about Mystery Science Theater that I have noticed from over many, many years now. Uh, I mentioned Red Letter Media and Best of the Worst a few minutes ago. And whereas they could watch some really just mind-numbingly horrible movies, for the most part, MST3K watches some entertaining movies. There's tons of entertainingly bad films that both Mystery Science and Best of the Worst have done, uh, but Mystery Science was, was very consistent uh, to this day to riff on movies that are still fun to watch. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are some ho horrible ones along the way, the Castle of Fu Manchu comes to mind, um, but uh, but then there's movies that are horribly bad but still entertaining to watch, like Manos. You know that's a great film, and uh, Doctor Mordred is a great example of that too. It's a movie that uh, is 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 a B movie. It, it's not widely known by many people. Definitely not as widely known as Doctor Strange, but it's still an entertaining film and fun to watch. And so that's why Doctor Mordred stands out to me is because it really is a decent film. And even with a decent film, though, this episode just confirmed for me, well, that and Munchie, I guess, confirmed just how 
how clever and on point the writing is for this season. They have picked a team of writers that really do take me back to the old days. I mean, the, the riffing is just on point from Jonah and the Bots and Emily and the Bots. Of course, Dr. Mordred was an Emily episode, and it just proved just how entertaining and, like I said, just very clever uh, the riffs are. I'm focused on just one subject. Ballroom dancing. I heard him right in here. I want in that head hole. <laughs> Yorick! Down close! Every football player! One of my favorite riffs, and they, they mentioned it in the post show, and I mentioned it too, uh, Emily and Kelsey Ann Brady when I interviewed them. Uh, if you want to check out that interview, it's just uh, down below. Go check it out. We had a lot. We had a lot of fun. They're, they're they're a couple of the greatest people on the planet. Just so you know. But anyway, we talked about this. My favorite line from that ep episode was Harryhausen and the Philosopher's Stone. The MacGuffin of Dr. Mordred was something called the Philosopher's Stone, which, if you're not familiar, that is the that was the European version of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And of course, at the end of Dr. Mordred. Uh, skeletal, skeletal dinosaurs come to life and fight each other, but in the jerky, stop-motion style of Ray Harryhausen. Harryhausen and the Philosopher's Stone! That was such a great joke! It was funny and so clever! And that's when I was like, that's it! I'm sold! I mean, I was already sold, but I mean, I'm, I'm definitely sold now on the writing for this season because that was just such a great joke. And so, I was all about it, and I had to mention it. I had to mention it on this episode. I had to mention it in the interview with Emily and Kelsey, uh, and it was worth mentioning, obviously, in the post-show of that episode because it was just so poignant. It was so good. So the writing this season, I mean, my God. I mean, it's like I said, it takes me back to the old days. It takes me back to classic mystery science theater because thanks to the Gizmoplex, well, I say thanks to the Gizmoplex, I have every DVD collection that was made available by Rhino or Shout Factory. But, you know, there are times when you, you don't watch them because, you know, that's a, that's a lot of work. Having to come into the room, get the DVD out, open it up, put it in the, that's a whole thing. Bullshit. The Gizmoplex uh, is very handy in that most of those episodes are just there, so you can click and play. So, for the last couple of months, I have been re-watching a lot of classic mystery science and then comparing it to the new episodes, and it's just, it's, it's right where we need to be. We're back, baby. We're back! Again, no slate against the Netflix years. Uh, those are really good, but it, it felt new. That felt like a new series compared to what we're doing now now feels like, okay, we're, we're finally getting back into our old stomping grounds. We feel comfortable again. We feel like we're back where we where it all started, where it all began. And that's what this season, I think, re really represents, is back to the old days, back to the old stomping grounds from what made this show as famous as it was to us back in the day. So, I mean, the writing is impeccable this season. And speaking of making it feel like the old days, uh, I really have to say, and and, and again, you know, I, I, I had a conversation with, with Emily and Kelsey uh, about what they're doing, and when I hear them perform, when I see them perform, that feels like the old days to me, too. Uh, I don't want, and again, and this is no slate to Jonah and Baron and Hampton. I love them. I absolutely adore them, and I think they're fantastic, and we need them in the MST world. We need them, obviously, but something about Emily, Kelsey, and, and Connor, would they, and, and Yvonne, of course, too, when, when they all come together, that transports me back to the old days. And I was thinking about it. It's like, why does that transport me back so so much as opposed to Jonah and the bots why does Emily and the bots transport me back more than Jonah and the bots and I was thinking about it and I think the reason why is because we knew who Jonah and the gang were before Mystery Science Theater now this may be a weird path that I'm going down and you may disagree with me I may even disagree with me some point it's at some point in this I because I, I may say to myself well, that sounds like a weird reason but no I thinking about it it really is kind of clear to me I think the reason why I feel that way is because like I knew who Jonah Ray was before he came onto MST3K I knew who Baron Vaughn was from his stand-up comedy and of course when when Mystery Science originally came back he was on Grace and Frankie 
Uh, I didn't know who Hampton was, so that was new. But and and Rebecca too. But like obviously, I knew who Felicia Day was. I knew who Pat Oswalt was. So it it was sort of like bringing it was like bringing back Mystery Science Theater with with names uh, with them. And so it it was like seeing those performers doing the show that you love. It, it, I guess it sort of feels like them cosplaying in a way. It's like celebrities doing their version of your favorite show. But the thing about Mystery Science Theater is it works a lot like Star Wars in that Star Wars worked so well because we didn't really know who the actors were when they first came about. Uh, that was definitely the case with the original trilogy. Even in the prequels, we didn't know who Hayden Christensen was. There were some celebrities. There were some celebrities in the in the prequels and and in the sequels as well. And people have talked about that. Really throws off the balance, does it not? Nobody is very excited about Liam Neeson in the Phantom Menace. No one was excited about that, really. But people did enjoy Hayden Christensen, despite his eh, little overacting. But the point is, he was new. Then you go to the sequels and Daisy Ridley. You know, she was fantastic, but nobody knew who she was before before you know The Force Awakens. And so that's why I feel like MST3K works along those same barriers. It works better when the people who are performing are people that you don't know. And they just come in, and then they just take up, and then they just go with it. And they make it their own. Uh, and that's the thing. Like, I didn't know who Emily or, or Kelsey were, or Connor, any of them, before... I saw them on the live tour, and then obviously when they came on in the new season. So it was something new, but at the same time, it was that it was that new talent, is a new talent smell that came in and just took it by the cojones and just went with it. And so I think that's why it works so well, is because they're new. As opposed to Jonah and Baron, and again, no slate against them. I still love their shows. I still love their episodes. They're great. But I think that's the difference, is that we know who they were. We knew who they were before they came on. Emily and the crew are newer in terms of we didn't even know who they were before this thing, whole thing started. And I think they just brought it. And as I said in the last episode, Joe Hodson doesn't make mistakes. He hires the right people for the show. He takes the time and studies and figures this out. And that's why we still love this show. Thir over 30 years later, closing, 35, you're closing in on 35 years of this show. And we don't hate anybody. That, there are some people who have issues with Kelsey being Crow, but she's fantastic, just so you know. I'm just putting it out there. She's amazing, so is Emily. But that's the point, is that Joel knows how to bring the people in. He knows how to bring in the right people, and that's why they've all gone on to bigger and better things, and w why the show still works over 30 years later. So that's where I really come down, is that Emily just makes it feel like the old days again. And something that she really has within her is a slice of both Joel and Mike. She reminds me of both of them. It's it's like if, if, if you combine DNA, of Joel and Mike, you would get Emily because she is she embodies everything that they did on the show. When it comes to host segments, she's very much like Joel. The time for regrets. It is the time to close the door to which sinister forces seek. Hey, to come Lord, in. If my garbage disposals out the blink. Fix it, stat. I gotta get rid of my old socks. Because Joel was very animated, Joel was very much, you know, when, when they would do the host segments, they very much were sketches. They would do sketches with each other, and she has that ability. She has that animated ability like Joel has to carry a sketch the way that she does. It, it's, it's extremely impressive. And then when she's in the theater, when she's riffing on the movie, she's cracking me up. And as much as I love Joel riffing movies, Mike would make me laugh more when he would do riffs, and, and Emily cracks me up. A friendly voice. I never thought I'd hear another as long as I lived. Two more weeks? What would I mix in this cup? I have newt, dried spiders. Peeled grapes that I call eyeballs? So she brings Joel's host segment talent and Mike's movie riffing talent and brings them together to create this new era. And, I, and, I, and that just continues on with this idea that I just, that's where I feel like it's like going back to the old days when you watch them together, all of them, because Connor is Connor very much has that satirical 
uh, you know, sarcastic Kevin Murphy quality to him. Happy New Year! And, and Kelsey has that very sarcastic trace quality to her. And Mrs. Golden, if you call the police, I'm going to have to tell them how I can hear your television through my bedroom wall, and then everybody will be in jail except Baby. Nobody backs Baby in a Come corner. On, so they come together and it just works and so that's why i'm talking about it that's why it feels like going back in time to the 90s when i was a kid and watching mystery science because they bring it out they bring it out like the old days something that you know again jonah baron and them are great but i just feel like for emily and them it's flawless it's just it just comes natural and so i think that's really why they are the team this season on the show without a doubt because they, they truly do make it feel like you're watching classic mystery science. And Dr. Mordred was a great example of that. Great episode all overall. I know I didn't talk much about the movie, but what more can you say? It was a great film, and the riffs were great, and Emily and the gang were great. So there you go, Dr. Mordred. Give me love, give me nothing. Ow, ow, to my and now... Let us get into the piece of resistance. That's right. The episode that we've all been waiting for. Clearly, I've been waiting for him. I've, I'm wearing him on my shirt. He's back there. I've got his patches back there as well. It was the episode that all of us as Misties, one and all, were excited about. It was episode 1306, Demon Squad, and the return of Joel Robinson, played by Joel Hodson. Daddy's back. This was the first movie that Joel had riffed since 1993. That's 29 years. And the man didn't miss a damn beat. The man was funny as hell. He brought it like he always brought, both in host segments and movie riffing. It was classic Joel. And the, and you talk about taking it back to the old days. He felt like, he, he made it feel like going back to the old days and watching a Joel episode. I mean, it was just that much fun. Uh, he was just on point with everything, and you know, it's like I said, he he, he looks great too. Let's, just, let's, let's admire Joel Hodgson right now. The man is in his early 60s and doesn't look like it. He looks like a million bucks, and he's just he's all over it still. And and it, it just it just came out in that episode. It was just so great to see him. They even brought back his old door sequence when he went back and forth between the theater. I, I saw a couple of guys react to that on Facebook. Uh, they just like went insane. It's like, look, I'm still shaking after they saw it. Like I wasn't that excited, but I was excited that they did that. That they paid that homage. Like they could have very easily just kept doing the old, you know, the, the the new door sequence that we've had since Netflix. But they they took the time and recreated the door sequence for for Joel uh, in this episode, and it's so great. It was just so much fun to see him. And not only was it great to see Joel, but it was great Great to see J. Elvis Weinstein. Josh Weinstein came back. He he also came back at the end of Dr. Mordred uh, when uh, Kinga and Max found out that they had to bring back a host from the past. Uh, Dr. Earhart, his character, Dr. Larry Earhart, goes back in time and in this episode he brings Joel back and it was great to see uh, him and Joel, Dr. Earhart and Joel, uh, you know, have some banter back and forth. It, that was great to see. Uh, I'm just glad Josh is still a part of the show, you know. Uh, Dr. Earhart, if you're not familiar with his character, he was Dr. Forrester's sidekick in the first season of Mystery Science, as well as the KTMA season. Uh, he ended up leaving after the first season, and he was replaced uh, in the in Deep 13 with Frank Conniff as TV's Frank, and he was also the voice of Tom Servo, and obviously when he left, he was replaced with Kevin Murphy and for the duration of the original series. But he was he was so great on the show, uh, and it's just great to see his character back, and it was great to see, like I said, him interact with Joel. And here's something else I love about Joel. Uh, since 1993, he has made two appearances two appearances now on Mystery Science. Uh, of course, this episode, he's going to make another appearance. He's going to do another episode later this season. Uh, but he's, he did this episode as of now. He did this episode, and then, of course, he was in the Soul Taker episode from season 10 back in 99. And what I love about Joel is Joel is always the why did the voice change explainer. Because in the Soul Taker episode, he finally explains why Crow's voice changed. We never understood how Crow's voice went from Trace Blue to Bill Corbett, but then Joel explains it. Wow. Crow, your voice kind of sounds different. Wow, weird. Huh. Uh, oh, I get it, you change your bowling pin, smart. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's how his voice changed. He changed his bowling pin. 
Well, that's all we needed to know. And now in this episode, he finally points out the fact that Josh Weinstein is not doing his high-pitched voice for Dr. Earhart. I've been wondering this since Netflix. Why is Dr. Earhart's voice not high-pitched? I guess, obviously, Josh didn't want to do it this time, which I get, because he's older now. He didn't want to do it. But he explains it. He's like, I'm glad you got that worked out. He's like, I'm glad you worked out your voice and you you made it work, because it was really annoying. And then, and then Dr. Earhart gets upset about it and goes back into it just a little bit just to give us a little bit but then goes back into the deep josh weinstein voice and speaking of the deep josh weinstein voice uh this this episode was a nerdgasm for anybody that loves mst3k this episode was a nerdgasm because not only did you get jill not only did you get dr Earhart, but you got josh playing servo again he started doing Servo's voice because Joel fixed Servo to his original factory settings. And of course, that would be uh, Josh Weinstein's voice. And so for the duration of the episode, uh, Josh was doing Servo's voice. And I, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't watch Mystery Science during its first season. I was just a baby at the time. Uh, but once I grew up and, and the, the episodes started becoming available on video and DVD, obviously I just, you know, binged them all. So this was really special to me uh, to see Joel and Josh in the theater doing that uh, because it's the first time that it's been new to me uh, since I first came across it. And, and to anybody who's been a lifelong, you know, since the very beginning, a fan of, of Mystery Science Theater, I'm sure it was something huge. Over, I can talk about over 30 years uh, since we've seen uh, Joel and, and Josh work together on, on MST3K. Obviously, they've worked together on Cinematic Titanic and a bunch of different things, but to see them work together on this, and it had to be huge. And so that, that, was, that was a lot of fun. I really respected that. Uh, I just thought that was awesome all around. I will say, one of the things I didn't like about this episode uh, is the fact that Joel came to us from the future from the year 3000 i couldn't wrap my mind around that uh, i i know i know since 1988 the closing line of the theme song is pretty much the the trademark of of the show just the show i should really just relax and i and i did i let it go but i was like uh, because I, upon the episode coming up, I was thinking in my head, how are they going to explain Joel? If they're going to bring him from the past, how are they going to explain him being older? You know, how does that work? How is that going to... I thought, oh God, are they going to do a stupid Picard reason? <laughs> if, if you've seen the latest season of Picard, Whoopi Goldberg comes back as Guinan and says she's gotten older because she wanted to. She just said, I'm just going to get older. Elorians age so very slowly. Yes, but only if we choose to. It was such a stupid reason. So I was like, are they going to do that on this show? Or are they really going to do that? But then no, he is from the year 3000. And that was clever, obviously, because Mystery Science Theater 3000. You know, that, that's, that was humorous. I did like that. But as I, I don't really understand it. And it just seemed, seemed kind of like a lame excuse to get him back on the show. When you could just easily said, when you could just easily been like, Dr. Earhart goes to Earth and kidnaps him and puts him on the satellite of love and then takes him back down, you know, or something like that. Eh, but whatever, you know, again, it worked. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about that. It doesn't matter. What matters is that Joel came back and that was the best part of that show, obviously, uh, was Joel's return. So, you know, it's little things. That's just a little nitpicky thing. And it's fine. It's no big deal, really. Uh, but I didn't. I didn't like that excuse. I, th I thought they could have worked on that a little bit better. But uh, who cares? Like I said, Joel. Joel is back. Joel is back on Mystery Science Theater 3000. That's more than we could ever ask for. So I let it go. Erin Lily Smith. I friended her on Facebook after uh, the episode was over, and she accepted. And uh, I, I love her to death. She's she's amazing. She was one of the writers of Demon Squad. Uh, she helped put this whole thing together, uh, and Demon and the, the cast and crew of Demon Squad very much like the cast and crew of Time Chasers and other films. They were just super excited to have their movie featured on on the show, and and overwhelmingly it was it was an overwhelmingly positive response from them, and they were just so like I said, just so happy to be featured on an episode. I even have here the the official statement that came from Fighting Owls Films uh, about 
their portrayal uh, on the show. Thank you from the Demon Squad. When it was announced that Demon Squad would be featured on MST3K Season 13, we were taken by surprise, but also excited. We kept up with every tidbit of news about the season, and in doing so found the Misties and series creatives to be incredibly welcoming, supportive, and just plain nice. The friendly reception we and the film have received has been overwhelming, and we want to express our sincere gratitude to all the fans, the show creators, writers, talent, and crew for the warm welcome and support. Support. Put simply, perhaps the real Mystery Science Theater was the friends we made along the way, fighting Al Films. So you gotta love that. You just, you gotta love that they were great sports about it. Uh, and then also we're just super excited to be on the show. That being said, I gotta say Demon Squad was not a great film. Uh, <laughs> very much just, yeah. See, I don't like, that's the thing is like, I don't like a lot of B-movies from like present time. Uh, maybe like in 10, 20 years you go back and watch it and it won't be so bad. But I feel like present time B movies are, are hard to sit through because they are, because you look at them from the point of view that we're in now, the technology that we have now. And you think, oh, they could have done that better. They could have done that better. They could have done that better. What were they thinking? Why didn't they do this? But you go 10, 10 15 years down the road and you're like, that's funny. Because we have, we'll have we'll have more technology, better technology in the future. And so you think, aha, uh -huh, that's funny that, that this looks so crappy as it does. And Demon Squad is not crappy. I'm just saying that it just was not the best film. And it wasn't put together the way it should have. It was kind of difficult to get through and, and to follow the plot. The plot was a little all over the place. But, eh, you know, it's fine. Uh, but the riffs were solid. Like I said, Joel is super on point. The man hasn't missed a beat in almost 30 years since riffing movies so it's great it was great to see him like i said in the episode i was super pumped and he was just amazing but the movie itself was kind of eh it was fine uh i do remember talking to emily and kelsey in our interview they said because emily was super excited for everybody to see the episode she's like oh this was a fun film to get through and kelsey was like yeah no <laughs> this was this was a lot more difficult than people thought it was to get through this I don't know if Demon Squad was their munchie, uh, but it's pretty close. Because thankfully they didn't have to sit through or, or even write for munchie, uh, but they did have to sit through Demon Squad, so maybe that was a little bit more. But Demon Squad was a fun enough film, and uh, like I said, they handled it like pros. And again, the, the riffs were amazing. Even if it was Emily or Jonah in there, it would have been fantastic because, like I said, the writing this season is just on point. So I was super excited to, to see Joel and, and the gang in there. Really, really was great. Again, I go to the closing line of the theme song. It's just a show. I should really just relax. And you should do the same too because it's going to be a few weeks until the next episode. But don't worry, we'll be back talking about more of Mystery Science Theater 3000. And I look forward to seeing what the rest of the season brings out. Until next time, you mother crabbers. Push the button hot, Toddy. Oh, that's that's me. I have the button.